So this is the uh, acoustic positioning webinar. All right, reinforce my theoretical knowledge of this technology. Thank you for that. Let me just clear that down again. Um, so first of all, then, just again, text on the screen or on the chat. Uh, what do you understand as a, as a short couple of words, a few words definition of what is acoustic positioning? What do you understand by it? If someone asked you, what is acoustic positioning? In a very short couple of words, how would you describe it? Just have a think. Just again, use the text put tools, put it on the, on the, in a blank area on the screen or into your chat. Acoustic positioning. Some of you have used it already, I know, so you understand positioning using sound waves, says Elias. Yes. Good answer. Anybody else? Positioning what? Determining position of an object in the real world by using sound waves. Yes. Excellent. Well, this is fairly basic level stuff, I know, but it's just to understand what, you know, what, what your understanding is already before we start. So I know where, where our starting position is. So what is acoustic positioning? Use a sound wave to position an underwater object. Yeah, that's it. Key area. Underwater. That's what we're looking at. Uh, yep, underwater acoustic pulses to locate underwater. So some good answers there. I'm going to clear your answers down. And... So let's so we kind of get an idea of what it is. It's, a, it's using sound to position something underwater. So why is it we need acoustic positioning? Why can't we just use GPS? So what's stopping us out there? Again, use the chat function or put it on the screen. What is stopping us using GPS underwater? Or GNSS. I mean, my, my colleague Stu will probably flash up on the screen. GPS signal attenuated underwater. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the signals, um, and I know that was difficult to spell because it came up as white text. So uh, GNSS is the correct terminology I know, but GPS is the generalized term for it. So it can't pen penetrate underwater. The air surface is a barrier to GPS signal. Absolutely. The GPS signal is an RF signal. It's very, 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 very weak. Uh, it doesn't penetrate the water. The salt water, the, or any water in fact, uh, attenuates the signal rapidly, and so therefore it doesn't work underwater. We can't receive satellite signals or signals underwater. Yeah, satellites can't swim. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so, uh, so let's go on to how GPS itself works. The reason I'm going to talk about how GPS works is because we use similar principles in our acoustic positioning systems. All right. So what we know from satellites is, well, you know, what is it we know about satellites? How can we use a satellite to give us a position on the planet? So we know the satellites are sending signals every second uh, and we receive them at a base station and we know what time they left the satellite uh, so they're, because they're all time stamped and we can see what time they arrived at our ground station or base station. So therefore we can determine how long it took for that signal to get there. So triangulation known, from known satellite positions. Yeah, absolutely. The thing we need to know, the thing uh, any GPS or GNSS system needs to know is where each satellite is. So there's a database of where all the satellites are, which orbit they're in, and we know precisely where they are in space. So we can triangulate or trilaterate our position based on the signals from them, right? So in order to do that, what are we measuring? What is it, in one word, what is it we are measuring to determine our position relative to those satellites? Pseudo range. Ah, are we measuring range? Are we measuring distance or are we calculating distance? What is the system actually measuring? Any advance on range or distance? Time difference, time of travel. Yes, spot on. It's about time. Um, it's about time. Where we basically, the system is measuring time and using that time is calculating the range, how far we are, because we know speed equals distance over time. We know the speed of our RF signal is the speed of light. It's a constant, nice and easy, right? So we can calculate how far we are. As we've already determined, we can't use GPS underwater. So what we do is we turn the whole system upside down, replace those satellites with seabed acoustic transponders, and we basically put in place a kind of underwater GPS system. Instead of using radio waves, 
we're using sound, acoustic positioning, all right? It's effectively like underwater GPS. Now, there are three types of acoustic positioning systems, and we'll talk about those each in turn. Starting off with the one that's most like the GPS system, long baseline. The functional word in that LBL, long baseline, is the word baseline. So, over to you again, guys. What do we mean by baseline? In this context, in a positioning context, give us uh, a short, crunchy definition of a baseline when we're talking about a positioning system. What are your thoughts on the word baseline? Again, up on the screen or in the chat, whatever works for you. Known distance between two points. Very good answer. Anything, anybody else? Anybody else on what we mean by a baseline? Range between two known points, line between two points, yeah. I like the word known. As known, known points, known positions give us effectively a reference, a start point to measure, yeah. In fact, so these are all the same things. Distance between two reference points, yeah. These are all brilliant answers, exactly right. Basically, it is a distance between two points of reference. And the reason LBL or long baseline is called long baseline is because those points of references are those fixed transponders on the seabed placed around the area going to work um, some distance apart. All right? So in typical, it could be 100 meters, could be 1,000 meters, it could be a couple of thousand meters, two, two and a half thousand meters, depending on the application, depending on, 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 the, on the, the purpose, on the whole project, all right? And the number of, uh, of uh, transponders required. But these transponders are placed on the seabed surrounding the area of work, all right? So the thing we're tracking is always within what we call the array of these LBL transponders. So they always surround the area. And the reason for that is because we're going to use these for trilateration, triangulation. And there are always four or more transponders on the seabed. In the same way that GPS works, you need to have four or more to give you some sort of redundancy uh, to make sure that it actually works. So three wouldn't be great, uh, but four is better. And more of that in the LBL um, um, webinar in a couple of weeks' time. But how it works in principle, really, uh, we have a transceiver. So this is the, uh, the, the electronics that go on the vehicle that we're tracking. This is on a tethered vehicle for tracking an ROV. This is called the Rovnav transceiver. This is the bottle with all the processing and power and comms, etc. And then this is the transducer element, not to scale. This is actually physically more smaller than this. Uh, but this is the transducer element that makes the sound and receives all the signals. All right, so it's like the antenna to, to this radio, if that makes sense. An underwater radio, but it's sonar, not radio. So we install that on the ROV, um, and then uh, similar to GPS, in order to position the ROV within the array, um, we actually need to request a position. We don't, uh, GPS, as you probably, as, you, as you're aware, is pinging every second. It sends, a, 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 your satellites are automatically programmed to send you a message every second so that it's constantly giving a, a position update. If we did that underwater, these transponders are running on batteries. They don't have the, uh, the luxury of an unlimited power supply of solar panels driving from the sun. These are down in the dark on the seabed. They're relying entirely on batteries. So in order to conserve that battery, battery life and make them last for as long as possible, we only get a position by interrogation. So in order to do that, we will send a signal to the ROV down the umbilical to the Rovnav transceiver, uh, telling it to send an interrogation to the transponders on the seabed. Once they receive that interrogation, they all respond with individual uh, responses. And, we, and the transceiver on the ROV measures that total travel time, but the, the, how long it took for that trans, the, the interrogation to go out and the response to come back. And then all of that two-way travel time data from all the beacons, right, but each one will have its own address, so it knows which one's talking. It sends all that data back up the umbilical to the processor to calculate where this is relative to our references on the seabed. Does that make sense? If that makes sense, please, on your uh, participants window, give us a green tick or a thumbs up, whichever works for you.
Here we are, green ticks, thumbs up, brilliant. Good stuff, all right? Uh, as you're doing that, it's good stuff. So um, the position is or as similar to GPS is worked out using trilateration. Some people call it triangulation, but the true term is trilateration, just being pedantic. Um, and the key thing about uh, LBL is the precision of our system is independent of water depth. If you put uh, an array uh, on, yeah, on the seabed 100 meters depth, and then you were to transplant that array, keeping the same distances, the same geometry, the same coordinations, uh, but put it in 1,000 meters of water, you get exactly the same performance out of it. Because everything is happening relative to those beacons on the seabed. Right? So matter, this is why LBL is used in deep water to position stuff on the seabed, because the precision is independent of water depth. Now that's tracking an ROV. The main purpose for, L, uh, for LBL operations is to put infrastructure on the seabed, the big structures of the big bits of, bits of kit to, to, for, for doing the um, uh, construction and uh, survey phase of a uh, male oil and gas infrastructure project. So in order to place a structure, this structure is now not tethered to the, uh, to the, to the vessel. Now I mean, so you've got the crane lines and everything, but there's no comms line to it. So we're going to be uh, basically relying entirely on acoustics to position this, uh, this structure. To do that, we place a mobile transponder, just like this one. We place that one or more onto the structure. Uh, and now we're going to use the ROV to relay communications to that beacon on the structure in order to position the, the whole thing. Uh, so the ROV may not be being tracked at this time. You can track the ROV uh, in our more modern software, but, uh, but actually most of the time, the ROV won't be being tracked in the LBL mode. It may even be clamped onto the structure in order to maneuver around or, be, or just be sort of swinging around and monitoring the whole process. Because as long as we know where the structure is, and we can see it on the camera, we know where the ROV is. But in order to position the structure, they'll send a signal down to the ROV, which will then relay that acoustically to the beacon on the structure, telling it to interrogate the array. The beacons or the, trans, the reference transponders in the array then respond with the individual responses. Each one will have its own address. We know which ones are re replying. Then the transponder on the structure will gather all of that two-way travel time data, the time measurements, and relay that back to the ROV, which will then subsequently send that back up to the, uh, to the, uh, to the PC on the vessel to calculate where this is relative to the does that make sense? Again, if you've got a green tick, change it to a thumbs up on the more button. If you've got a thumbs up, change it to a green tick. So I can see some change. Hands up from Angang. Ang Ang Ang. Is that a question there? Ang Ang. If it is, just type, type, type it in the chat or open your microphone and ask a question. No, no, just a green tick. That's cool. <laughs> Clicked on the wrong thing. It happens, all right? So if you do have a question anytime, just raise your hand. That's fine. I can hear what's going on then. Brilliant. All right, let me just um, expand my window and I can't see everybody in it. Good stuff. Right, uh, so that structure tracking. Once you place the structure on the seabed, LBO can also then be used for metrology purposes, which is um, basically, well, once we position them, we know where they are, is to measure how far apart a structure is or relative from one structure to another. All right, it's like ninja level LBL, if you like. So to do this, they'll place a trans transponder on each structure above the hub or the connecting uh, joint where they need to uh, put the interconnections in because they'll need to connect this thing to something else with pipe work, jump, spool piece, jumpers, uh, all the usual stuff. But where the hubs are, 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 are located on each one, they need to be able to measure exactly how far apart those hubs are. So placing a, a, um, uh, a trans transponder like this, this is a gyro transponder on top of the hubs um, with a brace quad LBL array around it just for extra rigidity. And, and quality control. Um, we can then very, very precisely position exactly how far apart these are. They're lateral, up, tra up track and down track, and vertical offsets. We know exactly how far apart they are and, and their orientation, as well as the kind of pitch and roll and headings, how these are actually lying on the seabed. All that data is put into a spreadsheet. That's, that data is then, you know, all, 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 all the trigonometry and, and Pythag is all calculated. It's put into a, uh, into a CAD diagram. The fabricators then take that, manufacture the spool piece or the, uh, or the jumper, lower that pipework several, you know, 100,000 meters down into the dark, offer it up to the hubs and it fits perfectly. It is like plumbing your bathroom 
using measurements you took through the window. All right, it's like cutting all the pipe work for your bathroom having never stepped in the room. Ninja level LBL. Um, so that is the kind of, like I said, the advanced level of, uh, of, of LBL stuff. The products that are currently out there on the market doing this, the main one that's being used is, uh, is, is our sixth generation acoustics uh, with, with uh, Fusion 6G, or now we're renaming it for like Fusion 1. Um, uh, that is what's being used for 97% of LBL jobs off, uh, offshore right now. Recently been updated uh, with Fusion 2. Uh, Fusion 2 is a product that allows our inertial navigation and LBL to be, to be used on, on one, one bit of software with uh, and the user interface is much more intuitive and the hardware is much more efficient. But they're the two products that are currently really being used for LBL operations, Sonodyne products certainly offshore. And Sonodyne uh, do have 97% uh, of the share of the LBL market at the moment. So um, that's where we are with that. That pretty much summarizes LBL. We'll cover that in more detail in a couple of weeks time in the LBL webinar. But is everyone happy with that? If you're happy, just give us a tick or a thumbs up. Just change it to a thumbs up or a tick on your thing if you're all happy, just so I can see some changes. Good stuff. Brilliant. All right, because I'm gonna move on now. I'm gonna move on to the next sort of version or next acoustic positioning system, which is USBL, ultra short baseline. All right. In this game, so if you look at an LBL array, these are references on the seabed as we had before. Um, but if and we use these to measure the position of, of a target, if we were to install those references into one transceiver head, then it becomes a USBL system. So we have a single head, and on the bottom of that, we have this thing makes the noise. This is set, this is the, uh, the trans, transducer that's sending interrogations out into the water column. And these are the hydrophones or the references that are listening out for the responses from the vehicle. So the difference in a way, as well as the actual physical uh, uh, structure of it, with an LBL array, the vehicle is interrogating the array. In a USBL, the array is interrogating the vehicle. So we ask the vehicle for interrogation, it sends a response back, and we measure using these references on the transceiver. All right. How that works, and the reason it's called ultra short is because they're only a few centimeters apart. Um, we've got different designs of different different types of heads, but basically they're very very close together. Ultra short baseline, very very close together references. So how that works is so we may, we may be we may yeah start again. I've been stumbling over my words this afternoon. <laughs> uh, so we may we may well use the USBL system to actually install the LBL system in the first place. So we'll mount the transceiver onto the bottom of the hull. Um, and if we wanted to track the position of these beacons on the seabed, but it could equally be an ROV or an AUV or any other, or a towed body, whatever it is we want to track, it matters not. The principle is the same. We send an interrogation out from the USBL head and we get responses back from the beacons, from the things we are trying to track. And it measures range and bearing to the target. Whereas LBL was a range range system, similar to the GPS, um, the USBL is range and bearing. So we measure angles as well, right, by using those different references. Um, the key problem, if you like, with the USBL system and why it's not applicable for every application is because the precision is highly dependent upon water depth. So you can see here we're tracking an ROV, we're tracking a beacon. The further these things are away from the vessel, the less precise our system is going to be. Right, and that's just the law of physics. Um, and, and I can aptly demonstrate that by, uh, if I get my draw tool up here, and I'll put this I'll dab on the screen in a second. If I gave you a red pen, and I drew a target on a whiteboard, and I get put, put the pen in your hand, and I said, in 30 seconds, jab the bullseye of that target as many times as you can in 30 seconds. I'd expect to see a nice tight grouping of shots, just like this, yep. Because the pen is very short. Then, if I was to give you a green pen, but mount that green pen on the end of a snooker cue, and then I told you to repeat the exercise and jab the bullseye as many times as you can with the green pen on the end of a snooker cue, I expect to see your positioning to be slightly less precise, a little bit more erratic, because it's difficult to control the end of a snooker cue from the opposite end of it, if that makes sense. So the longer that snooker cue was to be, the wider your spread of data would be. 
So if you turn that vertically, that's a USB Allen operation. This is the snooker cue and this is the target on the end. Um, the longer that stick is, the longer, further you're away from it, the bigger the spread of data is gonna be on the seabed, the more amount of error you're gonna have in that position. This is why USBL isn't always is, is used for installing an LBL system, but then we get an LBL system to calibrate itself in knows where it is precisely relative to itself. Um, but in order to sort of put this thing on the seabed with a high level of confidence uh, in, in its position, um, the best USBL system in the world is still going to have a certain amount of error on the seabed because of this issue here, right? It's just the laws of physics. But in, in principle, USBL, relatively simple. That's what a USBL system looks like. Are you all happy with that? Thumbs up or ticks on the screens. Again, we're gonna cover this in much more detail um, in, uh, in the next webinar, which is the USBL principles. But if you're happy, just give us a thumbs up and ticks. Yeah, good to see. All right, again, just, just to give you an idea, the product that we're talking about here for, on, for Sonodyne is Ranger 2. Um, there are a few variations of it. This is the full Ranger 2 sort of uh, sonar head that we use. There's a couple of variants, variations of that as well, different designs. And we've got a smaller one called Mini Ranger 2 and an even smaller one called Micro Ranger 2. But if you ever want to know what the, what the products are, that's what they are. Like I said, though, we are going to cover more of that in the USBL principles web. So moving on then, we're going to talk about the third acoustic positioning system, which is LUSBL. So bear in mind what we've just been talking about. What do you think LUSBL stands for? Again, write it on the screen, put it in the text. Warm your fingers up, get on the, on, on the keyboards again, or on your text call. LBL and USBL, yep. Yeah. Long USBL, absolutely. Your instincts are right. So you may not even heard of it, you may not even be aware of it, but basically it is a combination of the two. Long, ultra short bass line. It's like the uh, kind of uh, illegitimate love child of the two, if you like. So. Um, this has a particular application, all right? It's mainly used for dynamic positioning of drill vessels or FPSOs uh, or, or certain, you know, support vessels, whatever. But basically a, a large ship that needs to be held in position on the sea surface uh, where the seabed is too deep to anchor it in position, they'll use an acoustic positioning system to keep it in place. So we'll put an, a sort of pseudo LBL array on the seabed beneath it and a USBL head to position it. Now, clearly you think, why not just use GPS? Well, they do, right? DP systems, these dynamic positioning systems do get a GPS feed or GNSS feed. That is they usually, most, most, mo most of the time, their primary system into keeping it into position. But as many of you are aware, uh, GP GPS or GNSS is not 100% uh, uh, reliable all around the globe. For a global positioning system, it's pretty rubbish at that. There are places in the globe where it can jump around a fair amount because of uh, ionic uh, uh, interference, uh, it can be spoofed, uh, there's all sorts of issues why that, that may not be uh, as reliable as you might think. So a physical thing on the seabed to use as a reference is, uh, is, is, is often as the DP2 system. So a DP2 system has a different uh, um, safety case and needs to have two feeds into it so that if one of them does crap out, the other one takes over and it's got still got a good positioning feed. So the way it works is uh, we place the seabed, the, the beacons on the seabed uh, around the area of work we're going to be working and sort of surrounding the, uh, the, the, the drill hub or, where, or wherever it is we're going to be placing the vessel over the top. Uh, and then we, we use the USBL system to position those for a long time. So a good hour or so of tracking of these beacons independently uh, will get a a decent sort of spread of, of position data for each one, all right? And because we've got a lot of hits on that, we can, the system could do a statistical analysis and an algorithm to work out where this is most likely to be within that, head of, that hit of, of, uh, of, um, uh, of points that we had before. Remember the snooker cue analogy, right? Once it's done that, anal and, uh, that algorithm, it can then fix these in position into the middle of that spread of data and say, well, they're now fixed in position. And then we'll have, and then what that creates is a DP reference. A, fit, a sort of imaginary point on the surface uh, with a certain amount of error um, where we want to keep this vessel in position. 
Then we switch it to the acoustic mode and we start tracking those beacons in the same way that we did before. But now what we're doing is we're tracking the vessel relative to those beacons on the seabed. So it's working like an LBL system. So it's LBL ranges, but a USBL measurements that are using to calculate the vessel position relative to that DP reference we put in there in the first place. Uh, and then the errors from those positions are then fed into the thruster control system to keep that vessel thrusted in place and keep it on position. So if the wind or the tide starts pushing the, the, uh, the, the vessel in one direction, uh, it can detect it quickly using because the, these ranges will change and it will thrust it back into the, into the correct place. All right. Relatively straightforward um, in principle, an awful lot of hardware to make it happen. All right. um, DP3 systems need a third input. So sometimes we can also in include an inertial navigation system, effectively a gyro, which we put on the GP on, on, on the vessel. So as well as the GPS, as well as the acoustics, you've also got a gyro that senses how far the, uh, the, the vessel has moved away from its initial start position. Um, I, we'll cover more about inertial systems in the inertial principles webinar uh, in a few weeks time. But is everyone generally happy with LUSBM? If you are, ticks and thumbs, thumbs and ticks. Good stuff. I know because put some arrows there. <laughs> I am watching, I can see what you're doing, that's good. All right, so um, yeah, everyone's generally happy. So that's, that's, that's the positioning system. So right? we looked at what, what, what they do, but you know, it's an acoustic position system. So it's probably valid if we actually spend a little bit of time looking at the acoustics themselves. How, you know, what's going on down there. If someone asked you, what is sound? Give us a word or a couple of words that you might associate with sound. Again, use the text, use the, um, use, use the chat window. Just give us some words that you might associate with sound. Just to start thinking about what it is. Vibration in a medium, yeah, air or water. Good answer, anything else? Any other words you might associate with sound? Particles moving in medium, yeah. Pressure waves, yeah, good answer. Good stuff, all right, waves, yeah, compression, medium is some frequency, yeah, excellent. So yeah, these are all good answers. Uh, and to sort of capitalize on all the things you just talked compression the medium absolutely right these guys colin and sturm uh good good they're good uh, vibrations through the medium yet yeah. colin and sturm these are a couple of scientists that did some experiments in the 19th century they realized that when so they saw someone fire a, a, a gun in the distance they could see the smoke they could see the flash but it was some time later when they heard the sound and they were thinking why is that why can't i hear that straight away how can i can see it but i can't hear it until later on so they did some experiments and they put, uh, put two boats on Lake Geneva 10 miles apart. They set, uh, set a noise off on one boat, uh, it was a, a, a simulated um, uh, cymbal and a bell, which, which were both activated at the same time. And they listened for the sound moving across, uh, across the lake um, 10 miles away with a crude hydrophone. And they timed the difference. Now they were expecting, they were expecting the sound underwater to take longer than it did through the air because the water is thicker because it would be, you know, they clearly thought they would slow the sound down. They were surprised to hear and surprised to measure that the sound underwater arrived much, much faster than it did through air. Why? Why is that? Why would the sound travel much faster through water than it does through air? Density, yeah. The water being thicker, being more dense, yeah, its density is because the molecules are much, much closer together. Um, and if we look at this animation here, and I'll just start it, this is a sound wave moving through water or through air. And you can see, as you all said earlier on, is that those, those molecules, uh, sorry, pardon, I'll start that again. Um, it's the molecules bumping into each other. We're putting energy on the left-hand side of there, you can see that piston that's kind of generating the pressure wave, generating the sound. It's putting energy into the, uh, into the medium and it's making those molecules bump into each other, passing energy on from one to the next. And then you can see from the red dots as they go back to the original position. So they kind of expand and contract. 
but they all end up back in the so the medium itself doesn't go anywhere but the energy moves through it the closer those molecules are together the more efficient that process is and therefore the faster it takes place so the speed of sound is much much quicker underwater and because it's much more dense travels much further underwater as well all good things for us next thing i'm going to talk about is resonance all right because that's important to how we get things actually to work. Um, so if you're wearing headphones, this guy might be a little bit loud, or right? it's a bit of a video. Um, so I'll give you a countdown. Be, be prepared to lift one ear off your headphones, all right? I have tried to turn the volume down a little bit on my computer, but I'm never quite sure how loud it is from your end. So this guy's gonna play video, he's gonna demonstrate resonance quite aptly, starting the video in three, two, one, now. Yes! Glass number 90. And that's proof that it's not a trick. That was too easy, man. Number 93. That's five today. Safe to put your headphones back on now. <laughs> so he has finished. Jamie Vandera there is a rock so American rock singer demonstrating how to break a glass using his voice. How is he doing that? What is particular about the sound he's making that makes that glass break? And up on the screen or on the chat, whatever is easiest for you. What is particular? What is in, in one word or two words? What is particular about the sound he's making that makes the glass break. Give us a couple of words, a, a word. Frequency, yeah, frequency, frequency, increase in amplitude, yes. Two things coming through there. There's two parts to the sound that he's making. The first thing, as you've said already in the chat, is frequency. He was selecting the uh, the resonance frequency of that glass. The way he did that, he would tap the rim of the glass and it would make a note, it would make a tone. By singing exactly that tone, the same frequency, the pressure waves he's generating with his, with his voice are hitting the glass at the frequency, at the period of which it wants to physically vibrate. So it gets pushed away, it comes back again, and as it reaches the apex of its return, it's getting hit with the next pressure wave because it's happening at exactly the same frequency as the glass wants to vibrate. Um, and then the other thing that he's doing is is the, 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 the frequency is important, but also is the amplitude, the amount of energy. Because he's a rock singer, he's got a very, very powerful voice. And because he's able to focus that energy and be able to increase the amplitude of his signal, he's putting maximum energy into the into the foot, into the uh, in, in, into that, that that noise, which is pushing the glass so hard it overcomes its physical restraints and therefore breaks because glass is fragile. Now, why is that important? That is because that is how our ceramic, uh, how our acoustic transducers work. Inside an acoustic transducer, there's a piezoelectric ceramic material, which basically converts electrical signals into movement and back again, all right? So to generate a sound, we put the signal at a certain frequency into the ceramic element, which is tuned to resonate at a certain frequency. We put that, that frequency, that, that electrical signal in at that frequency and it converts it into physical movement. It vibrates. It starts to create the pressure waves in the water. It makes a sound. That sound is a bit like the way an, a speaker works. If you take any, take any speaker apart, not the ones that, you know, an old broken speaker, for example, have a look in the back of it. You'll see there's an electromagnet. It's the same way, you know, it's, it's a similar sort of process. So you put your music signal into that electromagnet. The, um, it, it, the uh, changing currents in the coil make the center of it vibrate, right? It physically makes it move. Those vibrations, because that's attached to the cone of the speaker and then basically makes the, uh, generates the pressure wave that you can hear, all right? Um, now, as there, so that's uh, underwater transducer is basically un, an underwater speaker, all right? Tuned to a specific frequency, it makes a very particular sound. 
as that sound then moves through the water and there it, and there's another transducer that's sort of sitting there waiting to listen out for it in passive mode it hears that uh, that that signal the signal hits the transducer element that ceramic material and it sympathetically or resonates the same way the wine glass did because it's tuned to resonate at that frequency so the signal comes through the water it makes it vi vibrate those vibrations are converted into electrical signals at the same frequency as we can then amplify, amplify and analyze as we need to do it it's the same way a microphone works so if you swing, speak or sing into a microphone the pressure waves you're creating with your voice make a magnet electromagnet inside the microwave vib uh, microwave microphone vibrate and those vibrations induce a current into a coil and then the coil is then it sends that electrical signal for you to amplify and do with what you like so our acoustic transducers are both a, an underwater speaker and an underwater microphone and the reason they work for most both jobs is they're tuned to a very specific resonant frequency all right now there are two types of transducers out there there's an omnidirectional one and a directional one so the omnidirectional one as you can see from the two diagrams here um, this blue line um, around here gives you an idea of equal levels of gain on either side. So you can see that the omnidirectional one has much more energy coming out through the sides and it's pretty equal in all directions. Obviously not straight up and down because that is where there's a piece of metal in the way. And there's also a slight dip straight above it, but that's just because of the design of the transducer. Whereas your directional one is, is about four times the energy actually in terms of decibels coming straight out through the top and about a quarter of the energy coming out through the side um, and this is what they look like inside all right so this is your omnidirectional one there's a donut shaped ceramic material there uh, which is helping it it's free to vibrate in all directions and therefore creates this kind of polar diagram uh, whereas on the directional side what you've got here is it's a, it's a classic piston style um, uh, of uh, transducer element uh, and on top you've got this metal anvil that helps focus that sonic energy into a beam so, you know, basically you can see that they, it's a bit like a, if you think about these in terms of light, this would be a bare light bulb and a, bare, a light bulb when you look at it from any direction is equally, equally brilliant. Whereas you, and this would be a your kind of focused torch beam. Uh, and as you know, as you look down the, uh, from the side of a torch beam, you can see light there, but it's nowhere near as bright until you stare right down the lens and oh my God, it's, uh, it's, it's super intense. So this is kind of how these are used. So omnidirectional and directional clearly have different applications and different uses so uh, again we use your stamp tool all right so click on stamp or tick or draw something i'd like you to indicate on my slide if you can which one is most likely to be used for lbl operations omnidirectional or directional which one do you think bearing in mind what we talked about earlier on about how lbl works which one do you think would be best used for lbl acoustic positioning some good ticks there. Omni, yep. Yeah. People circling all on the left hand side. Clearly, people paying attention. I like that, right? Uh, good stuff. Right, so if I clean these down then, Omni for that, yep, yeah, good. So now I'm going to clear these down. Well done, Lewis. Just going to bin those. And now I'm going to ask the same question for USBL. Which one would be most suitable for USBL? And there's a there's a delay as people are thinking about which one might be best for USBL. Lewis says the omnidirectional. Aha! <laughs> uh, going on the chat has got the right answer. It depends, right? It's a trick question. I do apologise. Uh, you can use either. It depends exactly on the application. So if you're track, if the thing you're tracking is going to be moving around or lateral to the vessel then omnidirectional is the one you want to use, all right? But for deep water uh, operations where the thing you're tracking is right down underneath the vessel, or if you're in a long layback and you, and you angle the, the transducer on the thing you're tracking back towards the vessel, then directional one just gives you more focus and more energy and therefore better chance to do it. So yeah, trick question, just to see if you're still awake and see if people are thinking about it. Uh, for USBL, we can use either or, it depends on the application and the project itself, good stuff. Uh, right, similar for LUSBL as well, actually. It all depends on the project and where they're, where they're stored in the water depth, etc. All right, so let's look at, we looked at how we make the sound. Let's look at the sounds themselves. 
Sonar, sonar has been around since the early part of the 20th century and um, and and for most of well, pretty much all of the 20th century it was all tone based it was analog signals right so we had narrowband tone based signals um, but when we applied it to acoustic positioning where we're sending a uh, an interrogation getting a response back and measuring that time of flight for LBL or, or USBL um, you could either get range responses or you could get telemetry data now telemetry data sort of happened quite late in the in the last part of the century which is kind of how you can send information through the water using sound um, and it was done in, in analog mode so it's frequency modulation like a two-tone signal to give you ones and noughts in the, in the process all right but it was basically a nice pure tone sound that we we're using and a, partic a particular sound again i'm going to play some audio now so if the last one was loud just again be prepared to listen to your ear because this is quite high pitch and therefore maybe a little bit uh, uncomfortable so just prepare three two one And the noise has stopped. It's safe to put your earphones back on for a minute. Um, so that that what you heard there was short ranging chirps and then some bursts of telemetry data, that two tone data that you can hear. Now the ranging chirps, how we got a range from those, similar thing we sort of, sort of talked about before. So you send an interrogation, you get a response back, and then you measure how long it took uh, to, to receive it. But actually to detect that signal with a tone based signal, what you had in the transducer itself was a replica signal, an exam, a sample of the tone it's listening out for. So as the signal comes through the water column, you can see the peaks and troughs as those frequencies that seems to match, you get these sort of correlation spikes uh, and they build as this overlaps and then die away again as it continues to overlap. So when the, two, when the, when the two signals perfectly overlap, you get this peak of detection, if that makes sense. Now your detection threshold, this is kind of where your background noise might be. So anything above the background noise is detectable. Uh, there was another threshold, which is not shown on here because it got a bit busy, was the authentication threshold. And that's when you start your clock. Stop the clock right? What we ended up with was sort of reasonable timing because this hump was, you know, uh, was basically a sort of, you get this as narrow as you can, right? So with tone-based systems in the medium frequency or 19 to 36 kilohertz that we're normally playing with, um, this, uh, this, the length of the signal was kind of crucial, really. So uh, in order to get good detection, they needed a certain amount of energy, a lot, long enough pulse length to get this hump to be big enough to be above the detection threshold. Um, and and a, a four millisecond pulse length was kind of generally used as a good compromise between precision and power. Because if you wanted more range or more power into, into the water, you had to extend the pulse length. And by extending the pulse length, as you can probably imagine, this hump got bigger and longer. So your precision of your system, the timing errors got worse as you started to try and push for longer ranges. If you needed high precision, then you needed to go for a shorter pulse length, but that meant that your detection, your, your hump itself was much, much shorter and therefore much smaller. So you, in order to be about, oh, sorry, I need to above, above the detection threshold, you have to be much closer to the target to get this above the detection threshold. So you lost, in order to get better precision in a tone-based system, you had to sacrifice range. And if you wanted to get range, you had to sacrifice precision. So not ideal, but the, the, the four millisecond pulse length was seen to be the best compromise between the two. Reasonable power to get reasonable ranges and reasonable precision to certainly make it suitable for most applications. Then in 2001, 2002, Sonodyne produced the first digital or wideband system. So instead of frequency modulation for the telemetry uh, and tone, what we did was we put a coding into the signal. We basically used the same waveforms that they were using in the telecoms industry. So the mobile phones, cell phones, TV systems, radios, communications, all that sort of stuff. They were using, they the whole world had gone digital. We were just the first to apply it in acoustics. So what we did here was phase modulation. It's called uh, phased shift keying. So what you do is you take the sample frequency, you switch it in and out of phase. To If it's in phase, it's a lo logic one. If it's out of phase, it's a logic zero. And what you end up with is this funny looking sawtoothy waveform, a different waveform. 
which meant it had a different sound. It sounded different in the water and not like anything in nature, therefore much, much le less susceptible to background noise and interference. Here's what it sounded like. Again, just mind your ears. So what you heard there was ranging chirps and telemetry, right? Uh, it's a bit different, sounded completely different, and also sound, it stood out from stuff in the, in the background uh, sounds, uh, background noise and interference, etc. was much, much lesser. Because of this, this funny looking codified waveform, when the signal comes through, you only get a perfect match when the ones and noughts match, when the coding actually matches. So you get this instantaneous spike of detection, uh, which meant that your precision was much, much higher. So because you got this nice sharp spike, we're able to increase the pulse length by eight milliseconds. That gives us more power and therefore more range. But we got increased uh, uh, precision. So with wideband systems, a couple of benefits, more power in the water, are therefore much easier to detect above background noise, and a much, much of an order of magnitude better precision in one fell swoop. Plus, because this was codified, we can use the same frequency over and over, over and over again and just put more coding into it so we can actually use more more, more systems at the same time. But in resting on our laurels though, uh, we, we also uh, produced then, we, we, in 2008-2009, we produced Wideband 2, our sixth generation uh, acoustic technology. So we moved on from binary phase shift king that we had in wideband one to one something called quadrature phase shift king. So basically sampling the cycle more times in each, each rotation, um, which meant we can able to get data embedded in our eight millisecond pulse length. So with an eight millisecond pulse length of ranging interrogation, including the coding, we also embedded some diagnostic telemetry. So it's like health checks, um, forward error correction codes, engineering type stuff that gives you a constant health check of the system whilst it's doing it, all part of that acoustic range. And, and the 6G also produced wideband to plus, which is the same coding, the same protocols, but in an eight millisecond pulse length. So uh, again, it gave you another set of addresses. So we ended up with like 600 plus addresses in the same frequency band that we're using for tone, where we used to have four frequency bands before, right? four frequency channels, and that was it. Now we have 600 plus channels. Uh, which enabled us more energy, better signal to noise ratio, much better performance and, uh, and reliability. So to summarize those, the sixth generation stuff, ranging and di diagnostic telemetry in one pulse. Um, and then if you wanted other telemetry, so uh, get data from a sensor on your, on your beacon or whatever, it was a separate telemetry string, but it's using the same wideband coding, therefore not nice and reliable. We've recently improved that again with 6 plus, which is wideband 3. Same coding, actually same addresses as wideband 2, but the protocols is better. We're able to do more with it. So it's more efficient, it's faster, uh, and much more user-friendly for the customer. Okay. Hopefully that all makes sense. Um, if everyone's happy so far, give us a tick or a cross, or a tick or a thumbs up. Oh, we got some, I've got a round of applause from, from, from someone. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, while well, they're doing that, I'll just summarize what we've covered. All right, so this is a, a, it was only an hour. Probably felt shorter or maybe even longer. I don't know. Depends how it came across to you guys. But we talked about what acoustic position is. All right, we discussed uh, the three different types of acoustic positioning. So LBL, USBL, and LUSBL. And we also talked a little bit about sound and of course the particular sounds that we're making, the acoustic signals that we use as, as, in our solar line systems. So just to summarize, this was the first one webinar one. There are six more to come. I hope you've all signed up for those. If you haven't, if you missed out on any of the other, on any of the other slots, I know they've been very, very um, uh, well subscribed. We are gonna put recordings of all of these presentations on YouTube for you to access at your leisure at some point in the future. And we'll announce when they go live uh, on our LinkedIn page as before. Um, and if you're not sure where our LinkedIn page, or most of you probably got this from with LinkedIn, there's our LinkedIn site. Uh, we're also on Twitter and uh, there's our website details there as well. Feel free to contact us at any time using any of those mediums. 
uh, email us at any time if you've got any questions if you want any more information on any other training that we do we are able in this uh, in this uh, um, uh, this environment to deliver uh, certain amounts of online remote training right so we can we, we're able to do most of our product training now online as well should require if there aren't any more questions i'm gonna uh, i'm just gonna say well thank you very much again for uh, uh, joining us this, uh, this afternoon or this morning wherever time it is in your in your part of the planet um really hope you guys are staying safe and looking after you, yours and your own um, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, speaking to you guys. I look forward to seeing you all again, hopefully.